Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming to my Not Another Online Workshop workshop, which uh, is a bit of a sharing and self-reflective moment between us. Um, I see a few, few participants, but nobody's talking. That's okay. Um, I'll do a whole bunch of talking, and if you feel comfortable to share when, you, when the moment strikes you, uh, that opportunity will come up. And then, uh, oh, oh, thank you, Claudia. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, I won't, uh, I won't, I won't go outside quite yet. I'll just talk for a little bit inside because I wanted to leave my house today and, and introduce everybody to the, the yard and the forest around my home um, and just try to be present in the moment with my computer without, um, how do I say it, giving in to screen apathy and checking my email and other things while we're present at, at some kind of online something. And I think that everybody's had their share of those experiences where, where we're, um, we're at work, but we're also at something else because it's just way too easy to tune people out uh, in a digital environment. So I think my entire point to this is to try really hard not to do that to, like and, and I mean obviously it should be hard for me facilitating a workshop to not check my phone or my email while I'm doing this but I also know that it's hard for all of you who are present here to do that so that's that's the workshop is how can we be present as human beings um, and uh, I know that you know a lot of people would maybe expect for there to be a whole bunch of artistic offerings and if we get to that point, maybe maybe that'll happen as well, where we can do some sharing in that way, and, and we'll see what's appropriate based on how many people attend and how much time we have, and and if we go through the full motions of sort of sharing and connecting a little bit, and then there's no time left, we'll end, and if there's lots of time left, uh, we'll either share more or we'll end early, one or the other, whatever makes sense of time. But um, so uh, I wanted to thank uh, the organizers for from the contingency of care residency for allowing me to um, present a workshop here uh, giving some space and agency uh, to my practice I really appreciate that very much uh, I also wanted to say that um, uh, if any you know as we move forward if anyone feels uh, the need to acknowledge their home territory or where they are right now in the chat or verbally to just uh, do so and as I move forward, I'll kind of do some of my own land acknowledgements of where this place is. But I, I think I'll do those once I get outside. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more appealing. But um, do you think we should give them a few minutes, uh, Claudia, or do you think I should just move forward? Yeah, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I think I think move forward, and they'll fall in as they as they arrive. All right, fair enough. So bear with me. I know it's always disorienting getting up and walking around with a camera, but that was always my plan here. So as you can see, I live in a relatively small house with, you know, which um, is a four bedroom little home here in Nipissing First Nation territory. I live uh, in Sturgeon Falls, Ontario, which is on 17 in between Sudbury and North Bay. Okay. There's lots of other little towns along that highway as well, but um, essentially this one's about 3,000 people and uh, it's part of what's Nipissing District is I guess the census district and uh, that whole district is only about 150,000 people. It includes North Bay which is the biggest town. So here's my front yard or the where the road is and you can see that road right there on this side of it is Nipissing, or sorry, it, on this side of it is Sturgeon Falls. On the opposite side of it is Nipissing First Nation Reserve, which spans all the way from right here to North Bay. So it's about a 40 kilometer stretch uh, along the North Shore of Lake Nipissing, which is Nipissing First Nation's official reserve. But I mean, the whole area is the territory. Anyway, uh, you can see my messy porch full of projects and stuff I'm working on. There's some performance art projects that are over there that haven't been enacted yet. So I'm 
sort of in process for a whole bunch of different things. Uh, I'm moving over, and I'll show you where. So my, my fun uh, COVID project. Oh. Was to get a dozen hens. I think the only one that has a name is the oldest one, which is right over there. And that one's name is Henry, which my children named a, 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 a hen, Henry, I guess. Well, I guess they're putting gender roles on, on these chickens, but that's fine. Anyway, um, yeah, last year we kind of got bored and started thinking about personal food securities. So we got a whole bunch of chickens and now we have a lot, way too many eggs on a daily basis. I eat a lot of eggs now. I wasn't planning on it, but I did. So you can see my house is up there and behind my house is this dense forest, which I know I'm gonna get eaten by mosquitoes by going into, but I'm going to anyway. Yeah, they're already like on me. So I don't get to come out here as often as I probably should, mostly because I work at my computer almost all day. I mean, like, I think a lot of us end up having to do that kind of administrative trap of being like uh, on Zoom meetings that are like 90% of our calls. Does anyone else feel that way? Like you're on the screens all day? Yeah. So this is like, this area right over here is like my swamp, but it's kind of dried all up because we've had a really hot year. My bird feeder has fallen over. I didn't put all this wood in here. I might actually take it all out. The previous owner of the property was like a, like a all-terrain vehicle kind of enthusiast and was trying to make racetracks with like old skids. So throughout the property, as we kind of move around, we're always like tripping and falling over random pieces of wood and metal. Kind of, kind of terrible, but you know, it has been 10 years. So a lot of it is more like rusted piles of nothing. There's like bugs all over my computer now. So that's the back of my house and my unmowed lawn. Probably needs to get done soon. And I'm just gonna sit back here for a little while, try to get the bugs off my arms. Oh. So, does anyone else want to share anything about themselves? I mean, I guess I probably should have said more about my background, but I'll get there, I guess. Claudia, do you want to say anything or share anything? Sure. Uh, I'm sitting on my back deck. We built a little makeshift sort of gazebo tarp thing so that when we do our Zoom calls, my husband and, and I, we can be outdoors. And today's a good day because there's a stiff breeze. I'm up in Barrie, which is about 100 kilometers north of Toronto. And uh, we've had a DLL, um, no, LDD um, caterpillar infestation, like big time, big time. And I'm one of the 50 people that's like fabulously allergic to them. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like poison ivy, but 10 times worse. But so glad uh, to be able to connect with you. I'm at OCAD. I'm in the IAMD program. I'm a part-time student. I'm also an art therapist. So, you know, the whole, like for me, it's all about art. Um, uh, allowing us to process our feelings and emotions. And uh, it's about being able to share that. My specialty is working with kids and their families, uh, kids that have cancer and, and, and their families. Um, so I'm a painter 
and um, I'm currently sort of focused on the littoral zone, that, that shoreline area, and we have a place up in Georgian Bay. And, uh, you know, I, I look at the water lilies and the water shield, and uh, for me it's like a whole constellation of symbols that connects with other things. I'm not quite sure what yet, and I'm still developing my research questions. Uh, so uh, happy to hear any thoughts about the, about the littoral. That's me. Wow. Wow. So, so, and your, your, is your, is your research questions, like, are you planning on including your painting in your, your practice, like yeah. in your, your, uh, yeah. yeah, I work wow. in uh, cold wax and oil on wood panels, and um, they're they're non-representational. It, it's uh, mostly a mark making process. So I'm really interested in like what makes a place a place. Like how do we resonate with the place? My ancestry is is German immigrants in the 1950s. So uh, I realized like I'm, a, I'm an uninvited guest. And still, when I'm in that place, there's a resonance that happens. Mm -hmm. So what is this resonance? And uh, you know, how can we convey that as, as artists to someone that maybe has never been there or will never be there? But yeah. one of the things I, I, I really... Uh, trust in i mean some call it biophilia some call it indigenous knowledges but the um the restorative capacities of nature uh i think are are immense and uh in you know the modern world uh just starting to be explored i mean maybe you know in the middle ages i'm thinking of hildegard von bingen and uh you know there have always been poets and artists, but I guess what I'm talking about is the mainstream where that scientific uh, focus and, and the rational mind was uh, privileged. I, um, I worked on a, uh, a project, and I might work on more, uh, but mm -hmm. um, it was in uh, Blue Mountains, which is over uh, on the other Hollywood. side. Hollywood. Yeah, right by Hollywood, yeah. 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 And um, it's a, it was a, it was a condom, it's, it's a condominium development that is uh, getting put into the town and they're trying to do leased prop leased homes. So like the idea of purchasing the home and then you, you lease the land from the corporation, but as they get, as they retain uh, property ownership, they're able to offer the homes that are relatively below market rate. So this idea that, um, uh, and then as they, uh, as they retain ownership of the property, they're also able to uh, work on making sure that it has like the lowest environmental footprint, footprint mm -hmm. possible. So they're really, uh, I found it really interesting watching, uh, like witnessing the process and coming into it. I'd come into it as um, uh, like a knowledge broker to try to make connections between uh, a few different of the project including the fact that there were um there was an architectural or sorry an uh, uh an archaeological site on on the property and there was uh indigenous artifacts uh excavated from mm. this case so there was all of this uh go-between with uh, the Saugeen people who are from primarily from that area and um as well as uh as like how to move forward with either representing what they had found or sharing or how to work between things. And it, it, it was, it's, it's in the reason why I bring all this up is that especially when you brought up um, the idea of like uh, corporate or mainstream like involvement. And it's, it's, I'm really interested in the fact that a, uh, a for-profit corporation was considering things like how to make the smallest environmental footprint how to work between many communities and look like instead of looking at how to um, respond to to kind of opposition groups but instead to be like how can we work with all different peoples to to kind of activate space or or 
you know, what do they need? And, and it was a little less uh, profit driven and a little bit more community driven. And I think part of it is that they acknowledge that community driven is profitable, which I, you know, and, and just to be blunt, like the, the uh, group that's doing, that was doing the, the development is um, uh, like a, uh, uh, like an investor group that handles the pensions of like a ton of public service workers. So this was all like, you know, like this is to them, it's about, it isn't about making as much as possible. It's just about making sure that they don't lose any resources from those investments. Right. Cause it's, it's equivalent to something like 500,000 pensions that they're managing. So, you know, it, it, it seems like very safe planning, but also in a way that, is reflective of how many other people's money they're really doing it with right which i thought that was also valuable but um that idea uh, of creating work and how to make it relatable across cultural borders i think is so so relevant right now and i always think about um people's proximity to issues right like how um you know just like at the beginning of the presentation i'm showing how like, uh, Nip, you know, Nipissing First Nation Reserve is right across the road from my house. And, and you know, I uh, have Indigenous background, but I'm not from Nipissing First Nation, right? So there's this other aspect of it being, this isn't my territory that I live on either, right? Even though I share indigeneity, it doesn't mean that, uh, um, that th these are my people. And there's that whole aspect of uh, respecting those boundaries and understanding how to navigate with the people you live with uh so specifically like in in georgian bay in that area i think there's a lot of people looking at that and and i think um what was it uh, uh what is it called sagin ojibwe nation which is a primarily uh like a uh like an energy and uh sort of uh, rights-based watchdog organization and I say that meaning they, they often have to reinforce existing relationships but they're not necessarily uh, just the Sagi nation they, they represent multiple different nations around the area and part of that is that um, some groups uh, are, are you know like when you go across the country there's First Nations organ like First Nations groups that are only like a thousand people so when you think about how small uh, that group is when negotiating on like a bigger scale, it's like, look at how disadvantaged they are, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not like you could ask them to, to do the same thing as uh, a municipality with 50,000 people that has like 100 staff in their, in their city hall, right? Like mm -hmm. they're, they're, you, can't comp you can't hold them to the same expectations of relationships. So there are these various advocacy groups that have come together to kind of represent blankets in that way. But so it, in other words, what I'm saying is the region you're talking about is luck luckily has one of those groups because there are areas that don't. Mm -hmm. So there's a part of me that's like, as the relationships continue, which I don't think it'll be fast, but there will be more things about like how communities can be working better together on things and the messages will come from, you know, the nations themselves or those groups that are representing them as opposed, but in the meantime, like while we wait, it's always like watching, uh, you know, watching them have to respond to like a municipality that overstepped in a relationship or, you know, I, I know that there's a few different calls to action on the Saudi and Ojibwe nations website right now. And, and again, I only, I don't live there, but I only know this cause I just did work in that region. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, to pay attention to those things and to show the acknowledgement of those relationships and, and your proximity to them, is probably the best you can hope for as someone trying to uh, to create work is to just be acknowledging who you're working with or beside or towards, right? Um, does anyone else feel comfortable sharing? I see a lot of people with cameras off. Thank you, Clayton. Hi, Isaac. Hi. And, um, Hi. Hi. I'm sorry, I came, I came a little bit um, late to the meeting, but I'm enjoying what you're saying. That's great. No, I appreciate that. If, he, uh, if, 
whoever feels like we want to go first. I know Isaac flicked on, I, you flicked on your camera first. I don't know if that means that he wins the race, but. <laughs> uh, what, I mean, I read in the description of this, of this workshop that we're meant to share something about uh, whatever we're, we're comfortable with about our, our real lives and kind of um, moving away from these online meetings, which is very refreshing to me. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything specific to share. I just, I looked at your work and it looks very interesting to me. And I, I'm at home with the kids doing online school and I'm, I've just been outside and I feel like I need to be outside a lot more this summer. That's really something I need to do. In fact, I do want to share one thing. Hold on a second. It's right over here. I just, I just remembered this. This, this was something that I made in the fall, and it, it was, it was kind of in response to online meetings and zooms and stuff. <laughs> so, it's basically like a version of me made of paper. And my idea was that I would like put this in a in a chair during a Zoom meeting. Sorry, it's kind of wrecked after all these months. And then I would like control the eyes and the eyelids from <laughs> below. So it's yeah, it's kind of wrecked now, but you can see the eyelids close through some <laughs> weird levers I designed. And there's eyes in there somewhere. Anyway, looks like they've rolled back in the head. Anyway, the idea was that it's like a real thing and it's a, and it's a stand in for me because <laughs> I, I just uh, couldn't handle it. There's like so much of this. Now I feel much more comfortable being on these. Like I know this is being recorded. You can see my kitchen and when the pandemic began, probably like a lot of people, I was much more private about, Oh, you know, how do I look and, what's over there, but <laughs> no longer. Uh, yeah. It, bo it, it bothers me on an ongoing basis how much monitoring is happening while we're doing this. Um, mm -hmm. In my uh, design for health uh, cohort, so I'm, I'm at OCAD doing that program. Um, they, uh, we, we reviewed what one of the previous cohorts had done, which was a uh, like a major assignment for sick kids, uh, Mount Sinai in Toronto, right? And um, that's all, you know, I, I downloaded a PDF, I reviewed it in class. And then I went to put on music on, on YouTube, which I don't have a subscription, I just opened up a playlist. Uh, and the first thing that came up was an advertisement for sick kids doing a fundraiser. And I was like, it really bothers me. <laughs> <laughs> that that it's it it was I guess it monitored that conversation in, in class during teams and has the ability to say oh you like that well here you should get involved in this and I'm like please like like, like you know how uncomfortable that made me <laughs> you know like um that that we're being monitored at a level of so bizarre and that's I think the biggest um pushback I have about this like I think that the interaction of uh, like taking you know geographic barriers away and, and having it that yeah we could have a uh, like a, a meeting of people in a zoom environment or, or teams or whatever it is that's that's great but the idea that um, like when we were if we were in a physical space being monitored is such a more either physical aspect like somebody actually recording it with a phone or something or like cameras on the wall that you could identify but in this environment it's like i'm just not tech savvy enough to, enough to actually identify where those monitorings are happening and i don't know if an average person is it makes me worry that we're losing more and more personal securities or or that um, you know remaining anonymous is becoming impossible which maybe it was always headed that way but yeah i definitely don't feel happy about that mm -hmm. I and I love what, I love yeah. being that that I don't know what to call it I was gonna say like a puppet but <laughs> it is it's like a paper 
I, I, I was actually thinking of, mm. I don't know if anyone remembers the heyday of the Simpsons, but there was, there was an episode where Homer goes to court and he, and he wears like these glasses with eyes drawn on them. So it looks like he's awake <laughs> so he can sleep while he's a juror. And, 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 <laughs> and then the judge is like, are those just glasses with eyeballs drawn on? And anyway, that was sort of the idea that, I mean, when you see all these boxes of people, would it like, is it, is it possible that with enough little squares that could be mistaken for me, just kind of sitting there if it a blinked now and then, but, and of course it's kind of a joke about all of this. Uh, to what you're saying, Clayton, about surveillance, I mean, surveillance capitalism is definitely here to stay. And I don't think we, anybody knows to the degree at which we're being monitored and to what ends. And it's part of the, the Faustian deal that we make with the technology, right? So if you want to have a Gmail account or you want to connect with people on a, on a computer, it seems that you have to give up that, these elements of uh, privacy. And like you, I have no ability to mine through the cookies or the whatever they are to uh, try and stop it. Yeah. I mean, on some level, I feel like it means there's a little bit more accountability for people who are, especially like in this setting, to speak in the way you want to uh, be kind of heard. Um, but then, of course, there's all the anonymity and and people on. There's just yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. I feel like I've spoken a lot. I want to hear from oh, no. Anam and uh, Claudia. Nice to see you guys. Nice to see you too, and I've spoken, so enough. Okay. Yeah, it's lovely seeing you guys, and generally the concept of this workshop, like literally coming out of our boxes, <laughs> I think it really helped. So uh, I would really like to call myself an interdisciplinary visual artist. So basically I create installation uh, and the subject matter is still live and it uh, comes from the historical painting. But I, uh, my take on still life is that I paint on objects directory, directly and then compose it and take a picture so that it gives an illusion of a painting. So right now uh, I'm in a room, which is a studio, which I have converted in a studio. So at the back, you can see an object which I'm making out of clay. And generally if I rotate my camera, so this is how I have placed my projector on the object. And obviously this works at night. So right now I'm just focusing on objects and with the projections, uh, I'll, I just project the moving images on top of the objects. And honestly, I feel like this takes a lot of my mental capacity and strength to be on the screens, but I, I make sure and I have this calendar up, which I mark that I go for cycling every evening. So I think, and over there I go and sit and that's the kind of white noise of the waves, which I love. And that is where I can actually read quickly instead of my studio. So that is my go-to place. So I think that is how I'm coping up with the screen time and Absolutely. especially the summers. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's really important to to establish those, those those sort of like boundaries. I feel like I have done uh, a lot of the opposite where I allowed the work, uh, like work to just override everything. And I, uh, part of what I'm doing now is uh, putting better boundaries in place with things because uh, it's it was interesting like at first uh, last you know March to say May or even June um, it was like the world didn't really uh, know how to to take it to, to take full advantage of the fact that everyone was in front of screens or had computers and then between that time period and, and like even early fall I felt like everyone figured out how to use uh, online systems. And then because you could have a meeting with someone in this space, as opposed to asking someone to travel somewhere for a meeting, 
everyone just started asking everyone to do meetings all the time. So like when, you know, when I started a job at uh, the artist run centers and collectives conference, which is like a national art service organization in August of last year and felt like immediately I would get up and by nine o'clock I was in meetings that would go almost until nine o'clock. And then, then as the fall progressed, people just started trying to do that through the weekends as well. So all of a sudden it would be like, I don't have a weekend anymore. I'm working 12 hour days every day. And how is this happening? Like, how is everyone just expecting this to be the way life works, right? Like I, I felt like it just became too much. And I, you know, I, I've never been a, uh, I, I was small when I was a teenager, but I, I've gained so much weight sitting around on screens that I'm like trying really hard to actually do what you just said and, and set boundaries and, and uh, you know, going for walks at night in order to, <laughs> to try to not have it that the full extent of the activity of my day was, uh, w was walking from my bed to a computer screen and then going back to bed. <laughs> Uh, I'm just heading in the house because I don't want to. I don't want my laptop to lo lose power while uh, while we're talk while we're talking. So sorry. To, to, I know it's a little distractive when people are traveling around. I if I can jump in, I I just had a thought about that sort of that accelerated screen experience that you just described. I think that it happened in part because people realized that they could have all these meetings suddenly like you just described but and so there's like a productivity piece and so businesses or whatever were exploiting that maybe hi <laughs> but then there's also the element which i had more experience with which was uh sort of like like social convening or people that were lonely or people that wanted to connect and we couldn't because we were in lockdown so it would be like have drinks with your friends for an hour or two at night like have a cocktail or whatever and so you end up scheduling everything so it's like i have a meeting here i have a class here then i have the social gathering which is supposed to be a fun relaxing time but you're just sitting in the same place looking at the same screen and you it's like it's just like crazy it's like more way more talking and socializing than I would probably do in real life because in real life there's those moments of commuting of just being alone when you're moving around in the world I, and it, I feel it's like a, it's oh yeah sorry, sorry. I, I think it's just a different way of connecting to mm -hmm. uh, Isaac like I don't feel that same resonance mm -hmm. that you do when you're in the physical presence of someone and so all my antennae are kind of out so i find it especially if i'm engaged in the conversation like right now um it's it, it, it's really requiring sort of every cell to be vibrating and firing whereas if we were like in a room together there would be a different um physicality of connection right mm -hmm. and uh for me i find that's what creates the fatigue and what what i've been doing is like there's a lot of reading involved in research if i really really connect with the book i'll get it in hard copy mm -hmm. as well as the digital copy just so i can rest my eyes relax my eyes and for me that's the part uh aside from emotionally but uh physically i find it's it's uh my eyesight that you know after 10 hours of screen work uh i mean thank goodness for painting i can close my eyes it's mm -hmm. haptic it's movement oriented mm -hmm. and and i it, it's um, it's a relief. It's almost like you know an antidote. It's like an aspirin for all that screen time is yeah. to be able to physically connect with something. No, you're right, and I wonder how people who work exclusively with computers are managing it. I mean, I work more with I mean a little bit of computers, but also outside animating outdoors, and so 
I don't know if your work, Clayton, is more exclusively computer, but that yeah, would be very I, challenging. I, I, I'm trying very hard to uh, imagine how, like, especially, like, I feel like uh, administrators, like people that are running organizations, mm -hmm. are probably exclusively on screens all day right now. Um, mm -hmm. And and I honestly think it's going to carry forward. I have unofficial confirmation from groups like the Canada Council that they're not planning on calling their staff back to the office, that they're planning mm -hmm. on allowing it to continue from home um, after the pandemic subsides. So this idea of, um, of how like you get up and go to work at your computer, but even when you have a day job that you're punching in and out of, right? It's because it's going to become more standardized. Um, and then when it's like, when it's dealing with more like events, uh, I wanted to uh, share this, this, uh, this book, which is the, uh, uh, the Rhubarb Festival is uh, Buddies in Bad Times Theaters, like yearly festival. So you can see that's when it took place. It was earlier this year. And instead of doing an online festival, they just made a book that was where the artists were, were actually like making physical objects and, you know, doing things and there's no online component so when I bought a ticket to go to the festival which I have it right here this book just came in the mail and that was it that's the festival is this book so it's all self-guided you know per, you know per, there's a little bit of participatory stuff where you know you could enact things but what I really enjoyed more than anything was that it was um sort of a a, a rejection of the expectation that we would do extra labor as uh, to make like digital versions of the, that space and instead be like, how can we do something else? And it, it's really sparked a lot of thought about how uh, I really have become more interested in, in self-guided experiences that are not exclusively online. So, um, so in other words, how a website doesn't replace the full spectrum of experiences. And I, I'd love to have a physical object that interacts with a website. So in other words, like, you know, you read a chapter and at the end, it's like, now go to this URL, which, you know, you didn't have, you couldn't navigate by just going online yourself. You have to be going back and forth. So the idea of, there's this idea of making it put the screen down to go to do something in the real world that only by going through it in the real world, do you then have access to continue online? Because I feel like a large component of these online spaces are um, are sort of like you just you just do it because it's easy, but you almost regret doing it because it's like like I'll go to a board meeting and I'll sit there for two hours and at the end if somebody said so what did you talk about I'll be like I don't even remember <laughs> like I don't know what we talked about I think I might have been responding to emails while other people were talking most of the time and and that's really bad because as far as a governance perspective. Um, <laughs> to be able to say, I don't, I, you know, I've probably approved things that I don't even remember. And yet that's my name approving them. So like, that's, that's really hazardous, right? Uh, Claudia? Yeah, I, I really connect with that. How, um, you know, when everything's online, I'll find even when I'm like writing something afterwards, it'll be like, well, what have I written? So um, we were up in Georgian Bay and uh, I just thought, man, you know, if I spend any more time on my iPad, which I love, I'm just going to go nuts. So I had to do a literature review uh, for my principal advisor. Not had to. I wanted to do the literature review, too. And it was all about stuff that I'd read and really felt strongly about. But I was routing around in the cupboards and I found this big stack of paper plates. You know, the... Um, Royal China paper plates, not oh, wow. the decorated ones, just the plain ones, right? And I just started writing on the paper plates and it felt so good because like feeling my pen go across the compressed cardboard. And then when I had a bunch of them, I could stack them. And you know, that fear of losing something, we're, we're pretty, uh, you know, laissez-faire household. So you write something on a piece of paper and it could be gone. It was like, no, this is my precious China, you know? 
And so then I had all this stuff written on the plates afterwards when I got home. I did have to transcribe it. But um, it was amazing how it turned what I had feared as an onerous task into something that was distinctly a delight. And so I keep remembering that. You know, I keep on thinking, so how, how can I turn that thing, and I'm on a board of directors for the McLaren Arts Center, how can I turn that thing into something else? So I've started drawing during board meetings. Don't tell anybody, okay? I, I met you actually at the OAG conference in a little box. Um, but yeah, and what I'm finding is it actually refines my attention because I have something else to preoccupy my monkey mind. And so that's what I've been doing is, is just drawing during board meetings. I, this is such a strange, oh, and I, I, I saw the hand up, but yeah. I'll, I'll be fast. I remember when I was young being punished in class for doodling mm -hmm. while the teacher was drawing, like I was being distracted. Now in classrooms, they actually encourage that because mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. a form of like retaining attention. And, and it's so mm -hmm. strange to think about being punished for something as simple as finding a way of bringing yourself to the point where you can, you can retain knowledge in, a, in an environment where maybe it would be challenging to just pay attention and like direct or stare at someone. <laughs> anyway, sorry. It's grounding. Yeah. It's grounding. Yeah. Um, I think the online experience generally, I was a very analog person. I always used to take notes with a pen and pencil. And generally, I wasn't really good at writing emails or something. I thought it was a very formal process. So uh, when this actually started and we had to type in things, so I think that is the time when I started using my both of my hands to type before I used to type from my one hand that how fluent I was in typing and using the computer generally so I just figured out the typing process and yeah so that was really new and quick for me yeah it's it's interesting I also think about how few people even know what analog needs anymore um <laughs> like there's so much there's so much to say with that i mean it used to be that we would say analog and digital when we were talking about like um video or photography or things because they were being converted to uh data as opposed to objects right or or um but now i feel like analog and digital discussions are less about the device and more about human behavior and that's kind of even more scary because if we're losing the analog part of human behavior, I don't know what we're going to be. Well, and, and also the sensuousness of perception, like using all the senses, because when it's a polarized screen, it, it kind of, it emphasizes the visual, right? And maybe there's some audio, but the tactile goes, the, the um, sense of smell, uh, and, and also the sense of touch, that haptic quality, right? Like, like I miss that. I miss only being able to use two out of five. And generally, I think before meeting, we used to, I, I miss deciding a place to actually meet. So now it's the platform, like are we meeting on Skype or team? <laughs> so <laughs> that is a change. <laughs> Yeah, and, that, and yeah. That's, that's complicated too, like how, um, like it feels like the amount of options that you would have if you were in a, uh, like a, a space station, you know, <laughs> are we going to listen to music on our screen or are we going to call our families? <laughs> like, it's so, it's so basic. I mean, it, that also, there's a part of me that was thinking about how, um, I wonder how many, how many, uh, research uh research projects are taking place to monitor how much we can tolerate this to see about what it would be like to you know either have to live in bunkers or have to live in space or whatever like just the comparable uh extremes because um you know especially those living in a, a small one bedroom apartment during the last year 
uh, and not having access to like say parks or anything, it makes me wonder like how how they're. Uh, I hope they're they're finding ways to be ha happy and healthy. That's I mean I, I don't want to speculate because it's not me, but but it it really does worry me and concern me. It's that connection with the outdoors. I I think like with the not made by humans world like if we're only talking with other humans and we're only connecting with things that humans have made then i think a lot of experience that we could have has has escaped us and that that sort of privileging of the human i think has also been a um you know, sort of the, one of the bedrocks of colonialism, that everything else then becomes a, a way of uh, uh, perpetuating profit and growth as opposed to other qualities. I'm, uh, I'm thinking about sharing something and um... Oh, geez, I started it. It's just really fast. It's only one minute, but it's a video that I did last summer. And it, it's kind of building on a, a few of the things that were discussed, but um, it was like a response. Maybe I'll just show it and then we'll go from there. Oh, let me see. Share screens. Are you seeing full screen right now? Yeah. Seeing, seeing a big white space? Yeah, and a line drawing. Okay. So that was the HD version, I'll stop sharing, of, uh, of a video that I uh, rotoscoped over of me just walking in my backyard and hugging and kissing my cell phone. Uh, it's a direct response to, uh, you know, a couple family members and friends uh, dying in the middle of the pandemic and uh, me not being able to go to any funerals, you know, which was just a, a horrible bummer. And, um, you know, that's continued this whole time, but, you know, uh, obviously I made it with specific intentions, but then it ended up translating into like this whole other aspect of life being like how uh, isolation was sort of affecting me and how I was responding with, with computers. I mean, every single one of those frames is hand-drawn animation, but at the same time, it's digitally drawn. So there is this part of me that like feels like even when I'm working, in digital formats. I'm trying my best to do it in an analog way. Um, I kept it as like a black and white line drawing just to kind of emphasize the sparseness and, and sort of how empty everything felt. And, you know, it was really uh, depressing, but it also was like me trying to find a way of um, sharing emotion when you can't, you know, hug the people you care about. Right. And that's, I think, a big part of all of this is this uh, that, you know, we view these 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 screens as sort of uh, physical barriers. Not that we all know each other well enough that you could all have a wonderful hug from me today. But, you know, I am a hugger. That's a thing. So obviously I don't, I'm not saying that, but but, you know, it's not an option, is it?
right? Like even if we become the bestest of friends, we have a we we are not in the same space. We can't interact that way. And and I think that that's really uh, what I was taking from what you specifically said, Claudia, about like the, the lack of senses and and um, I mean there's a there's there's positives to these things that I just don't think anyone really thinks about. You know how um, uh, <laughs> I mean like. I don't know how many meetings I've been to where people are sitting in their PJs and just sitting in their pajamas, like at as a work day. And I'm like, that's a good thing that they haven't invented screens that convey smell. Cause I don't think this person has had a shower a few days and yet they're coming to work like this. So there's a part of me that's like, yeah, I'm okay with, I'm okay with some of the senses not being there for, for this. I'd also hate to find out what my computer would interpret smells as and try to give that as a offering to people. But I, I'm what I'm hoping for out of this moving forward is uh, is less about innovations where they, you know, where where computers are trying to touch me or offer me smells to uh, to engage my other senses, and more about the limitations of these devices and the need for all other experiences and how. Um, you know, if we can really say that this whole pandemic process uh, that society in general has gone through uh, was showing the limitations of where things can go, it also means that they can come back from those limitations and find where it's more comfortable. So as opposed to saying, oh, you know, like, I don't want to be in the matrix where I have something sticking out of my head and I lose consciousness to be in a fully digital environment. Like, I just feel like I don't see the benefit to it as much as I'm sure other people are super excited about that kind of stuff. It, to me, it's like, um, I'd rather live being this than, I don't know, become something else. But yeah, I feel like I'm getting super uh, depressed and ph philosophical, which is a tendency of mine. I, I think it kind of questions that whole term productivity. And, you know, as we've seen, for example, in terms of control of environmental resources, what can be in the short term, highly profitable. So like you were saying, Clayton, like all day meetings and then work on the weekend, long term, is it sustainable? Mm -hmm. And our human bodies aren't that different from what they were 10,000, 15,000 years ago. And, you know, the, the wear and tear on our bodies and our psyches is such that, I mean, one of the things I'm really hoping is that despite all the advantages of Zooms and Teams, et cetera, that that doesn't mean the end of on-site learning or that that doesn't mean the end of, um, you, you know, going to a print studio and talking with somebody and sort of seeing the different products and uh you know that whole thing uh being there actually being there is one of my favorite movies do you guys know it with no. peter sellers no oh clayton you would absolutely love it yeah it's a, it's about this guy and he's a gardener and he's a gardener um i think it's in Chauncey france gardener isn't that his name yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and and, and so uh, what happens is circumstances change. And so this very some would say simple gardener finds um see I don't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> finds that things no, really I'll, change. I'll, I'll watch it. But it's a classic. If you can possibly watch it, I think you'd enjoy it. Yeah, no, I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. And um, one thing when you were, when you were saying that early, earlier in the conversation, I thought about um, how, uh, especially at the very early stages of the pandemic, like around the month of, you know, late April and May, I remember there were things like, there was very few, uh, there was like only essential things taking place because everybody was in that like early response time still. And, you know, I would go to the grocery store and there'd be like radically less products because some things aren't, aren't crossing borders anymore or some things aren't doing this. But there was still enough to just, you know, 
whatever. I didn't have the, I did I couldn't like, you know, uh, have like 10 choices of every single thing. I only had like two or something. Like it was just, it was just less. It wasn't like there was nothing. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I remember thinking how, um, like how much the world kind of was just easier because there was like less extra things happening for the sake of them happening. Right. Like, and I thought a lot about how much emphasis we put into you know whether it's marketing or creating policies that are to just just there for the sake of being there like that it really like I'm not saying that obviously there were things uh everything was great because I know there's things that I I'm not aware of that need to be happening or that weren't that like you know that's that's not you know I'm not saying oh it was so great why can't it be like that all the time but there was this idea that uh, a lot of the busyness in our world is kind of self-imposed like that we're we create an environment that is too uh full of things that are not really being utilized or necessary for many people just for the sake of being that busy and how uh i really took note of the the, the idea that things could slow down to like half speed and everyone would still be kind of okay like, you know, some things, obviously, there's going to be exceptions, you know, critical medical services and such. But um, but just that idea that it's like it didn't need to have that rapid aspect to it. And um, I feel I like, know. oh, if, if I can just add to that, I, I mean, I totally agree with you. I think I think the the breakneck pace of everything and the acceleration of everything, the pandemic put everything uh, to a sudden stop. And then people kind of were trapped. And as you say, they had much fewer options and life was simple. And you kind of, we were huddling together with whoever we had. Some people had no one and nothing. Yeah. And now there's, as things begin to open up and the vaccinations are allowing more return to normalcy, there's definitely a hope for, uh, sort of a building a pack in a better way with more equity and less intensity, I would say. And I like, that's how I always live because I can't handle the, the breakneck pace of everything. However, I think it also speaks to capitalism as a whole, because that's the thing that's requiring growth and speed and, everything needs more and we need to buy more and more junk. Like yeah. if we could just see that we don't need all those clothes and all those things, and we're actually pretty sustainable with whatever you have or whatever you need. Um, but that's a huge mind shift that a lot of people aren't really open to. But well, I think, I mean, the more I read, the more it like comes back to kind of <laughs> the arc our late capitalism and how that is contributing to everything that yeah, is how we're suckered in like yeah this past the past what um 16 months i have made two clothing purchases one was a plaid hoodie and the other was um was a a, a down vest and that was it. And when I look at in previous years, you know, or, or just even to go shopping, right? And I don't miss it. Like, yeah. and I'm finding things in my closet that, you know, I haven't looked at in years. And I'm either going, oh, yeah, got to get that. Or I'm thinking, who can I give this to? Mm -hmm. Like, whom do I know who this would look really great on or who would value this, like, like would enjoy it. And, and it's such a different thing rather than, you know, uh, I've got this event next Saturday. What will I get? What will I buy? So that, you know, I'm going to feel really good. It's just, you know, well, it's just not uh, there Claudia, anymore. You'll just you'll just buy a new filter to put on your face that will track with you for the event online. <laughs> now I got enough stuff in my closet. So yeah. See, I'm not wearing my pajamas. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, and it, it's almost with 
you know, it's with shame that I look back on how I spent my money and how I spent my time. And, you know, part of me says that was then, this is now. Like, yeah, feel a little bit of shame. Don't do it again. But, you know, don't stay there. Right? But it, it was an eye opener. And generally, I feel that we just, I used to think, you know, generally it's a human instinct to adapt, but really experiencing it right now that how we are adapting to the limited options and the things like as far as the buying clothes is concerned, concerned, I just realized I don't have any loungewear at home. And generally, I used to buy things to go out, but now you need to go get things to stay in. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> comfy yeah. things yeah well, i went to walmart because i needed I, I my my one pair of shoes i had broke so and I, they were bought from they were bought for like 29 dollars from walmart so i was like i need to go and find these shoes because i have i have like wide feet and i find that if i buy things online no matter how much you put in measurements it never comes back the way you want it to be like it's always like somehow gets messed up but um so i but i went there and i found it unbelievably stressful walking into the place especially considering the sensory overload of marketing uh where there's really nowhere to look where they're not promoting something to you and then um you know that in addition to the idea of like um people you know either masking or not and that relationship dynamic of sort of sort of like weird uh, social pressure where people are both terrified of each other and mm -hmm. ready to ready to socially police each other and all of those things that you're just sort of like it is it doesn't feel uh, it doesn't feel like it it used to in a way where you'd walk in and nobody was paying attention to what you're doing they were you would just go buy your crap and get out of there now it's like you walk in an aisle and people are like terrified like whoa there's someone here and they're like looking at each other and it I don't know if that's going to continue or not but it's it wasn't it wasn't something that made me want to do it again that's for sure it's <laughs> like know? when I, I go I for my shoes I got them you, you got them okay good because we find if we go for walks around the neighborhood or in the park right um people will look away it's like if as if they smiled that this would somehow infect them. And I find that so sad. I mean, I think you can still make eye contact. You can smile with your mouth closed or, you know, make a hello gesture or something. But, and I, I said to my husband, Michael, like, like, what is it? And he said, people are terrified. They're just bloody well terrified. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's hard when, you know what social like obviously you're not going to go hug somebody uh in you know in the next few weeks but which social conventions can be maintained to show goodwill and which ones like not yeah i i remember within the first um so i went to a board meeting uh, I'm on, I'm a board member for the National Gallery of Canada right now, which is a whole other thing, and I could talk about that sometime. But, but the um, I we were in a board meeting the week before the lockdown took place in uh, March. So I came home I think on the the tenth or eleventh of March, and and then they locked it down that following weekend, right? And so I had mm -hmm. spent the, and, and the first thing that happened when they announced the lockdown was a phone call where one of the other board members was in the hospital with COVID. So I had to like go into self-isolation. And oh, but, yeah. but even at that time period in that meeting before it, people were like nervous about shaking hands because it was like the whole conversation about this pandemic was already very happening, right? And at that time people would like take an elbow and like as if you would shake elbows so like rub the sleeves of your shirt against each other because they're trying to have physical interaction without um shaking hands because shaking hands is like bad taste i found that super weird but then now i'm like no one even gets close to each other <laughs> like at all so there was a part of me that was like 
you know, I, I, I could shake somebody's elbow. That'd be okay. I like rub my shirt on their shirt. Like, I mean, there's a, there's this whole side of it being like, um, everything we've done has been leading to the idea that this is going to go away and we'll be able to go back to something. Nothing has really happened to be like, what if this doesn't go away? Right? Like, so how do we, how are we going to come up with a, a behavior of having it that there's some sort of interaction obviously i'm not telling again I, I, I would it would be horrible to watch people just be like oh well then if we die we die and i'm like the, the you know pandemics would spread so fast it'd be unbelievable if people just started hugging and kissing random strangers on the street but like so i'm not i'm not encouraging that but i am also kind of going like uh like social structures to be like who's a 10 person bubble that you stay within because you can and then that way you can still get that human interaction. And, and if you don't have that, how can you sign up to be part of one? <laughs> you know, like that idea of like, yeah, um, everyone on the floor of that apartment building had to get to know each other or talk to no one for two or three years. Right. So there's this part of me that's like, I guess I'd rather become friends with my neighbor than talk to no one. Well, I like what Anam was saying that, you know, we adapt. So um, in Georgian Bay, for example, like we're in this little bay and the, you know, the, the cottages are, they're really modest. They're like, more like camps, right? They're not cottages. So there are all these rustic camps. And what we'll do to visit with each other, because there's about eight neighbors in this inlet, is we'll all get into our boats, uh, usually like the small fishing boat or paddle boat or a canoe or something. And then, you know, we'll, we'll decide to meet off of somebody's dock. So we're in the outdoors, like we're 12, 15 feet, of, feet apart. And yet, you know, you can uh, go with a glass of wine or a can of beer or, uh, you know, hot chocolate. And, and you know, we have these, these little, uh, I don't know, gatherings. I guess, and, and they're usually spontaneous, and then somebody sort of sees a grouping, and then they join in, but I've had so much fun with that, because it, it's sort of a, a way of finding a way that gives that connection. Yeah. And I generally feel that uh, the normate, uh, normative human behavior is a big question mark nowadays because mm. like you were saying that people behave in the same situation. I actually saw that how people behave in the same, same situation in a very unexpected way like they wouldn't have done otherwise. Like people, like Claudia, you were saying people not waving back to you or saying hi. I remember walking and I just saw people taking a U-turn or just going past me by like two, three feet away, that is fine, but still that is a lot. I remember going to my dentist uh, in the last month and uh, I had to get my wisdom tooth extracted, but somehow I just felt that people have started to actually care even more. In normal days, I wouldn't get an appointment the next day, but this actually happened that they actually realized and figured that how bad it must be. And I remember getting ready for the appointment for like two hours before, but I was still late because I couldn't figure out what to wear or how to go. And that is the social anxiety I felt. And honestly, the receptionist, I think I met her twice a week. And that is a new phase that I met twice a week. So I honestly felt like, I hope she could talk to me more about things <laughs> instead <laughs> of you know, just booking my appointment or writing my name. And generally I live with my husband. So I just realized that I have, you know, started uh, differentiating, uh, calling myself he, and calling him her, like constantly confusing the genders because it's just two of us seeing each other. So generally, I think whole of this experience was a very self-reflective experience. And yeah, that is what I have to share. Well, the, um, uh, oh, if you want to go, Isaac, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I was, I've been reading stories about how the fashion industry is completely confused about what people want to wear now because 
Like, are we inside? Are we outside? Are we going to go back to work or not? And also, just like Anna was saying, everybody has discovered new things about themselves or they've realized how they want to look or don't want to look or it doesn't matter. And, and basically the consensus seems to be it, it doesn't matter. There's no like fashion rules anymore. You can just do whatever you want because no one cares about that anymore. No one, I mean, hopefully this is kind of this, the possible silver lining is that people, at least in this moment, are being much more kind with each other and they're seeing people that are dressing in new ways or with things that would otherwise maybe draw ridicule and just accepting like, like that's what we can hope for, right. Is kind of a wider acceptance of, of, of anything. That's, that's hopeful for me. Well, and, um, like in the same way of um, interacting with people that out, out in the outside, I, you know, my mailbox is down the street. It's one of those green postal boxes. So I, you know, sometimes I walk other times, uh, you know, I'm all lazy and I'll just drive because it's, it's, I've got something else I'm doing or whatever. And this time I was driving. So I, you know, zipped over and I got it and I'm like, oh, I'll just circle the block and take a look. And it's like a nice day and, you know, see what other, see if there's other people out. <sighs> and, <laughs> and with somebody taking their, their child for a walk and, the, the little girl on the bike is like maybe like three so she's very little right and I could see like slightly older brothers one's running and one's biking but they're pretty far ahead and as I'm pulling up and like they're on the other side of the road you know and the mom's walking and the, the little kids there and I'm giving them a lot of space you know I'm driving and it's a residential area I'm maybe going like 10 or 20 I'm not speeding at all right but as I'm approaching them <laughs> the little girl like pulls her bike like out into the street and like puts her hand up and yells stop <laughs> and I stop because I'm being told to stop and this little kid's and the mom's like what are you doing <laughs> and she's like I don't want to get COVID <laughs> these are new clothes <laughs> and I'm like <laughs> laughing and I'm like what you know, and then I just kind of slowly move past this little kid and the mom's kind of scolding her a little bit, a little too embarrassed to make eye contact. And, you know, I'm driving by and I'm like overly cautious now because I could, you know, these other kids are there and I'm worried that the little girl's going to get worried that I'm going to like be, I don't know. So I'm like staying way over on the side of the road and driving super slow. <laughs> but, but I thought it was interesting because I'm like, I don't like like I'm really interested to see what children that uh, were very young and born in this environment, what their social expectations are going to be because they, they're growing up in an environment that's more equivalent to an environment a child would grow up to grow up in like, say uh, like 50 to hundred years ago, um, except there's computers, right? Like, but like, you know, before the pandemic, people were interacting frequently, everyone's roaming around. If you're living in a populated area, kids go and they just have play with kids. And because of this situation, it's been like, no, no, they're like literally interacting with their own family and no, no one else. And that is, that hasn't been that way for a while. Like it's, that's, that's very, I mean, I can't wait to see what kind of ideas they come up with as they start emerging like into school systems and things like that. And the, like how their expectations of like normal are gonna be completely different than what our generations have been, right? Cause they're, they're gonna have this other perspective that is, is their entire world, right? Yeah. Uh, speaking of kids, I'm sorry. I actually have to go and help my kids with the end of their virtual school day. But I would love to talk more about that because I'm I'm like witnessing some pretty wild things with their world and this. Well, yeah. I would love to invite uh, just because there's, there's four of us talking. Mm -hmm. I'd love to invite uh, you to share your email addresses, and sure. I'd love to stay in touch and even connect about mm -hmm. some arts opportunities in the near future if you're interested. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Here, I'll yeah. just type mine into the chat on my website. Okay, thank you so much for this uh, workshop, Clayton. Thank, thank you, Isaac. You have a great yeah. day. Yeah.
Yeah. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you. Your kids are lucky to have you. Oh, thank you, Claudia. Very yeah. nice of you. <laughs> oh, so patient, so kind, so Not knowledgeable. Always. Not always patient and kind, but <laughs> that's nice of you to say. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I feel like, you know, we've got about a half hour left, but we could also just take Isaac's lead and kind of wrap things up. Is there anything that anyone wanted to say or share before we, we shut things down? Big silence. <laughs> we've got a lot of um, air activity. That's why I keep shutting off my uh, microphone. Oh. Wow. It's almost like the air show is about to start. I'm, I'm not sure what it's about. Um, but yeah, I'll type my email into the chat as well, Clayton. And uh, I've, I've just really enjoyed this. Just being able to honestly think outside of the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. From within it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I'll definitely... Um, reach out to to everybody because I, I i have a few projects that i'm working on that i think could be really interesting to include include you in if it made sense and that's the discussion but um as opposed to getting into it now i'll i'll, I'll let things uh, kind of just sit for a bit and and think about them more but it'd be really great to uh, because this experience has been so relational and like, you know, equivalent to like, Hey, we're all enough. We're all friends now, even though we, you know, we've only known each other for like an hour and a half. Um, it'd be great to see where it could go in a productive way that is beneficial to everybody. So in other words, I obviously have ideas, but that doesn't mean that those ideas are to everyone else's benefit. Right. So the exchange needs to continue in order for, those ideas to be realized or to be pushed back on because maybe they're actually something completely else that ends up happening but that's that's all for next steps but um does anyone have any other big plans for the residency over the next couple of days like other things that you're attending i think there's one talk left and there's a closing ceremony i guess i think wow. it's just two, three days left because it was just for the month of june yeah and yeah. i think generally we are in the middle of writing a thesis proposals for a draft <laughs> so i think we're just looking forward to write that and attend less meetings i guess <laughs> yeah i'm at that place <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this was really helpful and generally i would just like to add i don't know it's just me or it's with everyone um, I think whenever I used to go to my studio or work somewhere else, I felt like, okay, it's done in there. Now you're back home to relax. But whenever I'm sitting in my house, I see the desk from my living room and I just feel like I should be working. I shouldn't be sitting. So uh, I think the level of productivity, Claudia, you were saying, I don't know how it is actually working, like the timetable and everything. It's like you're at work 24-7. <laughs> yeah oh claudia you're mute you're muted it's the helicopters there's about three helicopters swarming wow. about so i, I don't it must be the pride month because they're having these events oh. in every city maybe i've i've never seen it like this or i think it might be a missing person i uh, yeah, I was going to say hel helicopters flying in a certain area it could be a, a boating accident. Yeah, and they're or orange. Be, uh... And they keep on coming over this area. So I'm right at the edge of the bay, Kempenfelt Bay. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. But... Well, I hope everybody ends up being all right. I, I Boating accidents are always scary oh, for me. Oh, horrible. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. and then you were saying... Uh, like putting a time limit on things. I think that's really helpful. And like right now I find it very, very difficult to let's say even tidy a room. Like my mind just sort of seems really scattered. Uh, I'm also recovering from cancer treatment. So I don't always know if it's, you know, is it the, the chemo? Is it actually my mind? Is it the emotions? What is it? But what I've been doing is just setting the timer on my iPhone. And it's like, I have 
I have 20 minutes in this room, let's get her done. And that has really, really helped because that, I guess it's a word tied with back, vacuum cleaning, but hoovering, I tend to like hoover and I get easily distracted. And so just, you know, nose to the grindstone for 20 minutes and I'm, and I'm good. And I think that is the general attention span of a human being attending something, the 20 minutes, the first 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's yeah true. we can be so hard on ourselves, right? Yeah. Like, I want 12 hour productivity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was, there was four of us and we managed to be slightly more than 20 minutes productive each over this period. So congratulations. That's above <laughs> the average. <laughs> But uh, I hope you I hope you both get a chance to enjoy the rest of your days. You too. We sure will. And thanks so much, Clayton. Thank you so much. It's great Good to morning. hear you again. I enjoyed your presentation at the OAG. And uh, yeah, all the best. Well, thanks. I'll look forward to talking to you both again soon, okay? Thank you. All right. And Anam, I hope to see you too. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay, bye.